Hey everybody, welcome to Gig Bag Chat. Today we have a special one. We're going to be talking with John Gerard, the former TV news reporter and commuter dude of 11 Alive News here in Atlanta. He just got back from the Poland-Ukraine border, and we're going to talk to him about why he went over there, what he was able to do, the situation over there, and how we can help in the future. You're not going to want to miss this one. Stay tuned. John, well, it's great to see you again after so many years that you and I used to work together. Um, before we dive into where you just went, tell me a little bit about what you're doing these days in uh, after commuter dude world. <laughs> yeah, well, you and I worked together for six years at the networks mm -hmm. of 11 Alive. And I just want to say for people who, you know, I know you have a large audience, but maybe people haven't worked with you. You are one of the most positive people that I've worked with in my entire career. Now, I'm well, sure, you. look, I'm sure in news you had your share of bad days, but we would never have known it. And you were always amazing to work with. And I always really appreciated that. And there- well, I appreciate that, and, thank you. And to this day, there are Nick Ramey-isms, little <laughs> pearls of wisdom <laughs> that, that, that stay with me on a regular basis when I'm editing and things like that. So I just wanna say- Well, awesome. Yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad it worked. <laughs> So I'm in Orlando, Florida. Uh, I got out of news probably seven or eight years ago. Uh, I just felt like I wanted to do something, you know, more for myself. I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember this, but at the time I, I was a huge tennis fan. I loved the sport of tennis. And I heard that there was a national campus opening up down in Orlando with a hundred tennis courts that would be the home of American tennis. And I thought to myself, you know what? I bet they're going to need some video people down there. So Absolutely. I, started, I started reaching out to people, making phone calls. I sent probably 50, maybe 100 emails. And over the course of about 18 months, I was finally able to kind of wriggle myself in. And I've been down here for five years as a video production manager and uh, the director of multimedia for a teaching association, which is affiliated with the whole tennis scene down here. So that's what I've been doing for the past five years. That's very cool. That's awesome. So still a big fan of tennis then. Yes. You haven't, it hasn't burned, it hasn't burned you through like news. <laughs> it, it, no, but it does break down your body. So uh, any tennis player out there can relate. Uh, every tennis player I know has a bad shoulder, elbow, knee, ankle, or wrist that they're dealing with. So uh, while my spirit is indelible for tennis, <laughs> my body, not so much. Well, I just realized I hit that age where getting out of bed, I pulled a <laughs> neck muscle sitting out of bed. So yeah, I can imagine the tennis is uh, lots of running and, and every joint probably gets iced every day. That is true. That is true. Yeah. yeah. So you, uh, as the world knows, Ukraine and Russia have had a little bit of a problem uh, with Russia invading Ukraine. And uh, tell me your reaction when you first heard the news that that was happening. Well, I found it like everyone else or most everyone else. I found it to be really upsetting because it seemed to be to me, it seemed to be one man's war against the mm -hmm. people that largely didn't deserve it. Now, I know there mm -hmm. are radical cells and, you know, you read all kinds of reports about, um, you know, the past eight years and the conflict between the two countries. But for the most part, you know, the citizens of this country and the large cities are, are innocent bystanders. And what was happening with the invasion and the shelling and the constant missile strikes and the destruction of homes and the families being torn apart. Everyone who's seen those images on TV can relate. It's, it's a tragedy, it's horrific, and in my opinion, it's a war crime. And uh, it, it was just hard to watch on TV. So that was my introduction to it, like many other people. Absolutely, no, I totally agree. I mean, it's just some of the images that you see over there are just heartbreaking, you know, and, and the casualty rate of, of you know, just, civilians is just it's a terrible thing so um have you ever gone overseas and helped out in the middle of a of a crisis like this before no what what possibly gave you this idea to go run towards the gunfire right as so, it were like many people you know we're we're drawn to our television sets and through those television sets and devices and ipads and phones uh, come a variety of different tragedies from across the world that we're all exposed to on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a lot of us, especially people who feel empathy and compassion for other people, 
have said to themselves at some point, you know, I wish there was something I could do or, you know, I should do something. And sometimes we make financial donations and sometimes we get mm -hmm. more involved. Well, this time I made a financial donation like I normally do, but it just didn't seem like enough. And my partner Katya and I were talking about what we could do. And she said, well, why don't we see if we can bring a Ukrainian family here to the U.S. and house them? And I'm like, wow, that's a big, that's a big thing, but it's a great idea. Yeah. And we started looking into it and the U.S. policy about Ukrainian immigrants and, um, and uh, refugees is, is not very welcoming. So that wasn't really mm -hmm. an option. And so the next conversation between us was, well, maybe we should go over there. So that's how the idea started. That's awesome. So you went to you went to the border of Poland and Ukraine, that side of the so the opposite side of the invasion, correct? Uh, well, the invasion was happening, yes, on the east coast of, of Ukraine, on the north mm -hmm. side of Ukraine, and mm -hmm. then in the center of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So it, it, they've, for the most part, been keeping it away from the western part where the NATO countries exist. Right. So because I'm sure Putin does not want to ruffle even more feathers than he already has. So, yeah, right. the invasion has been kind of centralized. But there have mm -hmm. been some airstrikes in the westernmost cities. And at one point while we were there at the border, near the border, we spent most of our time in Krakow, which is about two hours mm -hmm. uh, west of the border. But we did go mm -hmm. up for a day trip. And on that day, there was shelling um, in, in, um, in Lviv, which is about... 15 miles, I believe, um, uh, outside the Poland border. So uh, mm -hmm. there, has, there, have, there have been some situations where it's gotten a little bit close. So, so, walk, so you decide to go help, which is a big deal. You've made that decision. Right. Um, do you go with an organization? Do you just say, hey, the two of us are going to go and we're going to see what we can do? Well, we didn't know anyone, and we did some research, mm -hmm. and I put out some Facebook requests asking if mm -hmm. anybody knew anybody with boots on the ground in Poland. And mm -hmm. a couple of people came back with leads, but nothing, you know, that really connected us to any organization. So at the time when we were on the plane heading there, we had no idea, except for the fact that we were going to Krakow, we had no idea exactly where we were going. We didn't mm -hmm. know who we would help, and we didn't know how we would help. Uh, we had some ideas of how that might look, but we weren't mm -hmm. sure. And we just kind of put all of our faith in what we were feeling. And we just went knowing and trusting that at some point the path would be revealed to us. And it definitely was. It seemed like it, you, it revealed itself to you pretty quickly, right? <laughs> yeah, there was some serendipity there for sure. Um, we prayed on it a lot because, again, we had no mm -hmm. idea what to do. And it seemed like every time we kind of asked the universe for some type of help or guidance, within mm -hmm. a pretty short period of time, something materialized, whether it be uh, the person who gave us our first volunteer opportunity, who actually became very good friends with us and who we still stay in contact with uh, to this day, whether it be the actual church-run refugee assistance center where we did the bulk of our volunteering. And those things kind of unfolded to us. Um, after we, you know, put the intention out there that we needed to be led to go where we need to go. And then it happened pretty quickly after that. Um, so sort of paint me a picture, if you can, of just the scene when you get there. Because I've seen the picture you post on Facebook, you know, are heart wrenching and it's just groups of people, you know, looking for food and water and necessity. Sort of tell me sort of yeah. how did that feel? So we got there on a Thursday, and the first thing mm -hmm. that we did was, well, we got a bite to eat because we were hungry, and then we walked uh -huh. toward the first refugee assistance center that we had researched on the web, and it was in the central train station in Krakow. And when we got there, the scene was just, it was, it was unbelievable. It was like out of a movie. Hundreds, if not thousands, of women and children uh, with blankets and towels like sleeping on the floor huddled under staircases, uh, shoved into corners, standing in huge lines, um, waiting to receive donations of, you know, maybe a piece of fruit or um, a, a protein bar or a yogurt cup. And then there were people in different places, volunteers all over the place, which was amazing to see. Little groups, some of them were well organized and looked like they were kind of affiliated with government organizations because they had yellow vests on. 
but there were also a lot of private citizens, a lot of Polish people who just went there um, wanting to help. And I mentioned earlier, the person we got our, our volunteer opportunity to start with, her name is Kasia, she's Polish, and every, she's a school teacher. And every Friday, she asks all of her friends and neighbors to collect groceries and necessities, hygiene products, diapers. And she fills up a, a, a huge car full of supplies up to the roof and drives them down to the Krakow train station and then unloads them and then gives them away in a little spot on the platform. And when we were looking for volunteer opportunities, a few places were fully staffed so they didn't need us. And we kind of walked up to where she was and we said, hey, we want to help. Is there anything we can do for you? And she basically grabbed us both by like, the, the scruff of the neck almost, picked us up like, like a mother cat or a mother dog, took us up to her car where we started unloading these supplies. And the next three hours were spent uh, making trips from the platform up to the car, bringing supplies down and then handing them out to people. And the need was just, it was insatiable. Uh, you may have seen some of the videos, maybe people mm -hmm. watching. I don't know if they've had a chance to see any videos or not, but it was people just clamoring for these items as quickly as we could put out a bottle of water, an apple, a yogurt cup, a piece of candy for a child, a pack of diapers, whatever it was that she had in her car in that moment, whatever we could put out immediately was being taken. So we spent three hours that day working with Kasha, making trips up and down from the car to the platform, giving those items away. And the need, even when we left, was still overwhelming on that day. But we knew from that moment, we knew in that moment we were in the right place. We just met one of the right people. And, and our, our, the mission that we signed on for is, is definitely in front of us and there's a need for us to be here. So it was real affirmation that we had made the right choice. I mean, just seeing some of those videos of, uh, that you posted of just how quickly the uh, the volume of just stuff, just the need was just overwhelming. Yeah. You know, you read about it and you, you know, you hear it. Oh, yeah, the refugees need a lot of stuff. But just to see it is just heart wrenching. There's only one word to describe it. Nick, and I wrote that in post. And the word is desperation. Mm -hmm. it was absolute desperation of people who knows how long they've been traveling. Some of those women and children had been hiking on foot, you know, prior to getting on a train, sometimes three to four to five days, just walking to try to, you know, get to safety. So, and the stories, you know, I, I looked inside the eyes of some of those people and some of the children and you can, you don't know what their story is and they don't speak the same language as we mm -hmm. did, but just looking into their eyes, you can see that they have been through a, a horrific trauma and, you know, anything that you can do in a moment to help, you know, hand them something, let them know that, you know, there's somebody that cares about them. Um, we felt was an opportunity to help. And it was really, it was hard to see. And I broke down, uh, my partner Katia is an emotional person and she cries watching TV commercials. <laughs> I'm a little, I'm a little more crusty than that. But my first um, exposure to that train station and seeing all those families, I broke down crying five different times. At, at what? Um, one of the most heart wrenching pictures I saw is you brought some stuffed animals and some toys with you, and handed those out, and just seeing some of those kids with just a stuffed animal you know, being able to bring at least a little comfort in this sort of craziness. So what, what kind of stuff did you bring anything other than these, these toys? Did you bring anything with you? So we didn't really know what to bring. We had read that they were short of medical supplies and mm -hmm. we assumed that they would need food. We only had one large so suitcase to bring in addition to our, you know, small carry-ons for clothes. So we brought, we filled that suitcase up with stuffed animals, mm -hmm. and protein bars and uh, Tylenol. And literally that stuff was all gone within five minutes. The need there was so immense that you know, mm -hmm. we, we, and you know this, and I want to thank you and, and everyone else. We, we did a Facebook fundraiser mm -hmm. and I so appreciate your generous donation. Your sister donated. Oh, yeah. You shared mm -hmm. our post a bunch of times and we got some donations off that. We, we raised more than $6,500 and the money goes a long way there because the dollar is strong. So what mm -hmm. we were able to buy for, we filled up probably 50, maybe 60 grocery carts. And wow. every grocery cart that we filled up in the States would have probably cost 
maybe 500 bucks because it was meats and cheeses and yogurt and juice boxes and, mm -hmm. you know, lactate milk boxes for the kids and diapers. And I've mentioned that a few times, hygiene products. In the mm -hmm. States, each one of those carts probably would have cost $500. There in Poland, each one of those carts probably cost $200. So the oh, amount wow. that we were able to get for the money for $6,500 was enormous. But even still, we could, have, we could have kept dumping carts and carloads into that situation. And it's just a black hole of need. It's just an absolute black hole of need. So as accomplished as we felt, and I've never felt more accomplished for doing something, at the same time, I felt totally inadequate in the very same moment. That mm -hmm. paradoxical feeling. And it's because the need was just so tremendous. One of the other pictures that I distinctly remember is you went with uh, the a couple of fathers uh, to go load up uh, a van full of water. Yeah. And you, how many cases of water did you end up getting? I okay. mean, it was a towering, <laughs> towering pile of water that lasted like, what, two days? Not even, not even. Not even two it, days. That's one of the heartbreaking stories, but... Again, a, a great sense of accomplishment that, that mm -hmm. lasted a very, very short time. Um, it was a Saturday night, and they were they were out of water. And we knew mm -hmm. if we went and got grocery carts of water, it would be gone in five minutes. So I asked one of the priests if they knew anyone with a truck. And he said, we actually have a, a large cargo van back at the rectory. And I said, well, if you can, let's rustle up some volunteers, and I'll go with them. We have money from our donations back home. And I will, you know, we'll get as much water as that cargo van will hold. And so uh, the priest who normally shops for the rectory came and one of his seminarians, and I'm telling you, those guys were hard workers. I thought I was going to, you know, put them to shame. No way. Those guys, really, <laughs> they worked very hard. And so we got there and in two hours, we were able to load three pallets of water and other supplies into that van. The, the the rims on the van, the wheels, <laughs> we, we were like that. Scraping and the whole we way. Hit a bump. And uh, we brought that back. And then a human, we formed a human chain back at the, at the refugee center. And there were 20 of us unloading the van with a human chain water, you know, case to case. And we put it up, uh, up against the wall. And there were three pallets there. And we felt so good. And the next day, we came back at uh, 11 a.m. And it was gone. So it lasted, oh my gosh. It lasted less than 24 hours. So... The thing, the, 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 the lasting feeling that I left with is, you know, we, we didn't fix the problem. We didn't solve the problem. But while we were there, at least some people on some of the times when we were there got to eat and got to drink a little bit of something. And mm -hmm. that was our takeaway from the whole trip. You actually decided to extend your trip, right? We did. Uh, we were just about out of money at the time, but we still felt like we could help some more. We were scheduled to stay for 10 days. Mm -hmm. and we just felt like, you know, if we extended for three or four more, four more days, I can make another call on Facebook to try to raise some more donations and we can do some more good. And so we did. We extended our stay and we were originally staying at a, a hotel across town. And we decided that we wanted to be right next to the action. So we found a little hotel right across the street from the refugee center. And I asked the clerk if they could possibly give us a room that faced the refugee center so we could see, because when trains come in, you could see when the mass of people would hit the tent. You know, okay. as soon as a train would come in, um, maybe, you know, two to 300, sometimes up to 500 people would pour into that tent looking for food, clothing donations, anything. So in the morning, the first thing we would do is look out the window, see if a train had arrived. And if it did, we'd be right out there trying to get breakfast supplies for them. And if not, we knew we had a little bit more time before we had to gather stuff. So, um, yes. For these trains, the, the people that came in, is this sort of like a final destination for them? Or is this just part of the, the there's just a stop on the way somewhere else, right? Well, the trains are going all over Europe and mm -hmm. mainly leaving from Lviv, which is the westernmost city in Ukraine. And they're mm -hmm. fanning out all across Europe. We picked Krakow because it's the closest large city to the border. And we figured there would be, you know, some need there. And we were, we were certainly right. But those trains are going to Warsaw. They're going to cities in Romania and Moldova. They're going to other European cities as well. So um, it's, it's fanning out all over the place. And while we knew that we couldn't 
really help people beyond the immediate temporary need because we were mm -hmm. only going to be there a short time. There were also people on the ground trying to help people find more permanent locations. They were being, they were being referred to the Ukrainian consulate where they were working on their, their, um, their residency papers. They were being uh, sent to other cities where they may have had family or friends. So where we were was a very temporary stop and it turned okay. over quite regularly. So the same group, of, the group of people that we helped in the morning, wasn't necessarily the same group of people that we would see at night. Gotcha. Um, so what did you work with? Any did you see any other organizations there, or is this just a lot of? Because I know the 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 priests and uh, the lady that you first met, they're all locals, right? Yes. Yes. Did you see a lot of people from other countries, or was it just primarily the Polish people there? Well, we did in the in the refugee center where we were volunteering. There were people from all over the country. There were a lot of mm -hmm. um, volunteers from the Netherlands. They brought down a large group of people, and every morning they were cutting fruit and making fruit salads for up to a thousand people, which w were gone literally in two hours. There were mm -hmm. people from the United States. We met people from Seattle and New York City. There was a girl that we met from Israel. Two of the main volunteers in the refugee center uh, were, were Ukrainian, of Ukrainian descent. So they were able to actually talk to all the people coming in, which was really helpful. That's very helpful. And then Polish people, and we met somebody from Nepal. And so it was really a nice mix of people from all over the world. As far as organizations go, when we were up at the border, we only made one trip to the border. Uh, mm -hmm. We felt like we could do more good in Krakow, where the, where the refugee mm -hmm. camp was. Uh, there definitely were um, there were definitely governmental organizations that were in play up at the border. I believe Care.org was there, and mm -hmm. um, maybe UNICEF was up there also. I believe. Um, for people who are watching this now that weren't able to help you uh, donate financially or anything like that while you were over there, do you have any suggestions on how people can help? now because the need's still there it's still there it's 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 as large as it was when we left if not larger i think when we were there i think five million people had evacuated from ukraine and now i mm -hmm. believe the number is 10 million so the situation is, is just worsened there are a lot of great organizations care.org is a really good organization and if you go to charity navigator you can kind of research which organizations have the highest marks. CARE is a really good one. They're the ones that I generally donate to when I donate. And mm -hmm. sometimes you can find, uh, they might be offering a match on a given day. So I think CARE is also working with Richard Gere. And for a while, Richard Gere was doubling people's donations. So oh, that's great. if you are looking for a place to donate, try to find uh, a site where they're gonna have matching donations and make sure that you check on Charity Navigator that they have a high score and that that money is going to people on the ground because that's really important. Well, John, I wanted to thank you for doing that. Like you said, it's very, it, it's, you know, you see all these terrible things, whether it's in the United States or around the world and you go, you know, I always get tired of the, oh, thoughts and prayers thing, you know, but to be able to go do something uh, you know, I really respect that and, and I'm amazed that you were able to go do that. And it felt, you know, for, for the little that we were able to do to help you, I love the fact that I was able to give it to you and know that it was going to a good place. And I really appreciate your time and the effort that put into that. I know that wasn't easy physically or emotionally or, you know, spiritually just to see the devastation and, you know, work all day. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate you very much. Nick, I, I, I appreciate your words. And I just want to say in closing that, you know, we felt incredibly blessed to be able to be there and honored, honestly honored to be the stewards of those donations, because there were a lot of people, like I mentioned, that from around the world mm -hmm. that came there to help. But very few had resources to be able mm -hmm. to bring in a steady flow of grocery carts. And that was huge. It was huge to the people who were volunteering in the tent, who could then actually give something out to the refugees. And it was super important to the people, you know, who've been displaced from their homes and were hungry and thirsty. So, you know, we feel honored to have been the stewards of, of donations from, from kind hearts and souls like you and everybody else who gave. And 
there's nowhere in the world that I would have rather been for that two weeks. And I actually took vacation time from my work to be there. And it was worth, it was worth every moment. I wouldn't have changed the thing. Well, we will keep an eye on the whole situation there and hopefully it will get resolved quickly with no more uh, death and destruction. And we will just, we'll do what we can. So I appreciate it. Thank you're an, you. You're an optimist. It's going to take, <laughs> it's going to take decades to clean up this mess. Yeah. It will, mm -hmm. but you know, thoughts and prayers. You said sometimes we get tired of it. Uh, There's nothing wrong with thoughts and prayers. And absolutely. That with a little giving and a little physical mm -hmm. labor, that's all we can do. Absolutely. Well, John, thank you for your time. I appreciate thank it, you, sir. Nick. It's great seeing you again. Great seeing you.